Hello, hello. We're on to chapter five of Grass-Fed Cattle, How to Produce and Market Natural Beef by Julius Ruchel. <clears throat> um, we're, as of last chapter, we're now into the chapters that I've never read before or even really looked at ahead of time. So I'm interested in all this, same as you. And let's get to it. Chapter five is... Uh, fairly long electric uh, chapter 5 electric fences and rotational grazing it is one role of predators to keep wild herds bunched together and migrating as a group shepherds mimic this role with domestic herds but fences have largely replaced shepherds in North America and Europe the classic barbed wire fence is expensive to build and highly labor-intensive to construct and maintain and provides no flexibility for grazing rotations as the pasture growth rate changes throughout the seasons. It also tends to be very hard on wildlife and people, restrict wildlife movement, and have a short lifespan averaging between 10 and 25 years depending on climate, livestock pressure against the fence, and how rigorously it is maintained. Um, the electric fence is a cheaper, more effective, longer lasting, safer, more animal friendly option. It is designed not as a physical barrier that restricts cattle movement, but as a psychological barrier that cattle fear to cross. Fear of that hard hitting little electric wire enables us to use a minimal amount of material, usually just one or two strands of wire, to accomplish what rolls of barbed wire and page wire simply cannot achieve. Wildlife can easily pass over or under the wires, and there are no barbs to tear the life out of an animal that gets tangled. An electric fence is also easier and faster to put up than other fences and can be constructed at a fraction of the cost. Because it does not function as a physical barrier, it has more than twice the working life of a barbed wire, post and rail, or page wire fence, despite requiring significantly less maintenance. Portable electric fencing gear allows you to uh, further subdivide pastures at your convenience. You can mimic wild migration patterns by varying the size and number of pasture subdivisions over the course of the seasons to achieve an effective grazing rotation. So this stuff's like just super portable. You just move it around and kind of pasture as you go. Let's look at this mini section. Imagine the possibilities. The ability to use electric fencing to focus your cattle's grazing impact according to your needs opens up some surprising labor-saving opportunities. With a few well-placed permanent wires to hook onto with portable wire reels, I've used cattle to mow road edges and used the bull herd to mow my lawn, though sheep would have left less of an impression. The cattle's ability to plunge through brush, graze between rocks, and clamber up steep hillsides allows you to maintain unsightly or difficult terrain at little or no cost. The cattle cheerfully grazing for free, what would otherwise cost fuel, time, and wear and tear on equipment, if it is even possible to maintain these areas by mechanical means. Besides, it is much more to fit. <clears throat> excuse me. It is much more fun to sit down on the lawn with a glass of iced tea, watching the bulls grazing and fertilizing the lawn, than it is to push a lawn mower and breathe exhaust fumes. Here, here. Okay, so back to the reading. Uh, seasons to achieve an effective grazing rotation. So we can move the wire around and our pasture is essentially mobile um, using these, these single wired fences that are electrified. A combination of permanent and portable electric fencing gives you the greatest flexibility in, main, uh, in managing the separate environments on your land as well as the greatest ability to respond to the changing seasonal grass so you can ration it effectively over the entire year. Chapter 24, Your Grazing Infrastructure, contains a practical step-by-step -step guide to help you design your own electric fence grid for your farm. With the help of electric fences, our livestock become a versatile tool to manage a farm's ecosystems. Let's look above. We have a barbed wire fence, page wire fence, post and rail fence, and then electric fence. Uh, oh, so they have three electric thingies, but still way more simple and flexible. Mm, factors to consider. When designing permanent electric fences, keep portable fencing subdivisions in mind. Design with an eye toward flexibility and convenience and plan to use portable electric wires to ration the grass supply over the entire year. If permanent paddock divisions are too wide, a single reel of a portable electric wire will not be long enough to span the distance, which makes setting up portable wired subdivisions frustrating and impractical. 
If the design of your electric fence grid requires you to use long, portable fence subdivisions greater than 1 8 mile, check with your local electric fence supplier to be sure that it sells portable wire spools that are long enough for your purposes. That's like a tiny little detail, but it's like you totally get back and you're like, oh no, the spool doesn't work. I have to go like all the way back to the store. It's probably a lot of going back to the store over the course of this journey. Know that there is considerable variation in conductivity in different portable wire products on the market. All wire has some resistance to the electric current passing through it, causing a predictable voltage drop the farther you get from the energizer. The thinner the wire, the greater the resistance. Consequently, it is important to know the voltage drop of the portable electric wire type that you choose to ensure it will retain a sufficient shock through the entire length of each fence subdivision. In order to contain cattle, you need to maintain at least 2,000 volts on the fence. Because of their wool insulation, sheep need 2,500 volts to be deterred from crossing the fence. Bison need even more voltage than sheep. Horses need less voltage than cattle. Most standard poly wire and poly tape drop from more than 8,000 volts to less than 4,000 volts within approximately 100 yards of wire and fall below 1,000 volts in less than 500 yards of fence. Wow, okay. Some companies sell high grade poly wire and poly tape, sometimes called turbo wire or turbo tape, that have more wire strands in the braid and therefore carry more current. The turbo wire is capable of carrying current much further with only a 2,000 to 2,500 volt drop per 1,000 yards of fence line. That's quite a bit better. Birds are an asset to the natural grass-based management system because they eat flies and bugs, thereby reducing parasite pressure on the cattle. Many bug-eating bird species seem to prefer living where two ecosystems meet. That's why you'll find the best bird in wildlife viewing at the edge of a forest, brushy area, or body of water. The cover and shade provided by one ecosystem is in close proximity to the abundant food resources provided by the other. Most birds remain within approximately 200 feet of the brush or forest edge, so bird activity around cattle will increase dramatically if you design your fields with no more than 400 feet of open pasture between shelter belts. That's an interesting thing, survival trick, right? Because if you know that birds tend to be on the edge of a forest, let's say you're lost in a forest, well, if you're hearing birds, it's like try and continue hearing birds until you're out of the forest, maybe? Awesome. Um, let's look down below. Don't combine electric and barbed wire. It is tempting to string electric wire on or along an old fence to extend its life or because you need electric power along an existing fence line. Fencing companies will offset insulators that hold electric wires away from the old fence, but I strongly recommend against combining barbed wire and electric wire. Cattle grazing along an old fence that's been electrified are not able to reach under the wire from both sides of the fence, so the grass tends to grow up onto the fence and around the electric wire. I think I just got a couple water drops. It's a, uh, wow, the clouds are pretty impressive right now. Holy shit. I should be taking a photo. Oh, give me a second. Oh, I take this photo. Okay, so I took a photo and it stopped the audio. I don't appreciate that iPhone. I feel like you should continue recording while I'm taking a photo, right? That's being a real smartphone. Um, but all is forgiven. Let's continue. Where are we? Uh, don't combine electric and barbed wire. We're in this extra section. Um, where the hell was I? <laughs> okay. Um, so he strongly recommends against combining barbed wire and electric wire. Cattle grazing along an old fence that's been electrified are not able to reach under the wire from both sides of the fence, so the grass tends to grow up onto the fence and grow around uh, and on the fence and ground out the electric wire. If the cattle cannot keep the electric fence free of growing grass, time-consuming mowing will be required to maintain it. In addition, the combination of electric and barbed wire can be deadly for cattle, wildlife, and even people. Any animal that accidentally gets caught in the wires is in for a horrible experience. So many closely spaced, barbed, and electrified wires make a trap that entangles and slowly electrocutes and tears to shreds whatever creature it catches as the animal struggles desperately to get free. Equally dangerous is the practice of electrifying one of the barbed wires on an electric fence, another practice used to extend the life of sagging barbed wire fences. 
Likewise, barbed wire should never be used to carry an electric current when building electric fences because its barbs and the softness of the wire make it very easy for an animal to become entangled when it is shocked by the constant pulse of the electricity. Use only high tensile electric wire or portable electric wire specifically designed for this purpose. If an animal gets tangled in it, it will break much easier than barbed wire, whereby the current is instantly cut off. In the case of high tensile wire, if it breaks, its stiffness causes it to coil into large open loops, which are much, much less likely to wrap around an animal than the soft, malleable barbed wire coils. Part of the beauty of an electric fence is the ease with which both you and wildlife can move under or over it. In a combination fence, ease of movement is lost. Accidental entanglement of man or beast is the stuff of nightmares. Yeah, sold on that one. All right. Um, only electric. Where were we? Mm. Oh. Hey, Rockman. Uh, the turbo wire is capable of carrying current much further with only a 2,000 to 2,500 volt drop per 1,000 yards of fence line. So that turbo wire sounds like a good deal if you want to spend more money. Birds are an asset to the natural... Oh, whoops. I was already here. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 400 feet of open pasture between shelter belts. Uh, bird activity around cattle will increase dramatically if you design your fields with no more than 400 feet of open pasture between shelter belts. Also a great trick is basically to put birds in a position to live with the cattle by including some trees, I think. Is that what a shelter belt is? Putting tree cover you know, somewhere near them and then the birds can eat bugs which might otherwise bother the cows. Much like birds, cattle are shade seekers and enjoy the cover of trees and brush to cool off and relax while they ruminate. By repeatedly seeking out a favorite shady spot, they will severely trample the soil around it. In addition, by repeatedly returning to the same location, they concentrate their manure piles in this area <clears throat> rather than spreading them out evenly in the field. Consequently, the valuable nutrients contained in the grass they eat will not be returned back to the field as a whole, causing a significant drain to the field's fertility and productivity while over-fertilizing the concentrated area. This process is known as nutrient transfer. To avoid nutrient transfer, separately fence open pasture and brush. Individual trees left within a pasture become ingredient nutrient magnets as manure is concentrated around them because the cattle continually return to them to seek out shade. Some people remove all trees from their pastures to eliminate this nutrient drain and create an even distribution of manure around the pastures, but if you design your grazing rotation to accommodate daily pasture moves, you can limit access to each tree to just one day during the grazing cycle, thereby reducing nutrient transfer. If the cattle stay longer, they will return to the same tree day after day and draw nutrients from a much larger area. To further reduce the nutrient load at the base of each tree, cut off the lower branches. This causes the shade to uh, migrate around the tree without reaching the base as the angles of the sun changes throughout the day. Thus, the cattle have to lie further from the tree and move more frequently to stay in the shade. Good lord, brilliant. Oh my god. This is so interesting. Oh my god. There's so many interesting details. Oh my, this book is so cool. I know. Cow nerd. All right. Um, there's a picture above here. Cattle are forced to lie further from a tree's base and move more frequently to benefit from shade when the tree's lower branches are removed. This minimizes manure overload at the tree and reduces nutrient transfer from the surrounding pasture. Brilliant. So you're using the sun. Energizers. The heart and soul of an effective electric fence is the energizer. Its strength, measured in joules, which essentially reflect how far an energizer can push a current through a wire against resistance, must be size based on the length of the fence and number of wires used, the soil type, and how moist the ground is. Also important is how much vegetation will grow up against the wire, because vegetation bleeds electricity out of the fence and reduces its shock. If you choose a large energizer, one or ten joules or more, any plants touching it will die back or burn off as they come into contact with the fence, thereby keeping the fence relatively free of vegetation. A good rule of thumb is to calculate one joule uh, to six miles of electrified wire. For example, if you build 12 miles of a two-strand electric fence, your energizer should have a minimum rating of four joules 
for 24 miles of wire and 12 miles of two strand fence. We can go back and review that some other time. Grounding an energizer properly is crucial. Flawed or insufficient ground systems are responsible for more than 90% of all problems with electric fences. The electric fence system is an incomplete electric circuit powered by the energizer. The circuit is completed when something touches the fence, allowing the electric charge, or specifically the electrons in the wire, to flow into the earth. In order to complete the circuit, when electrons are lost to the ground through the feet of an unfortunate cow, the energizer must quickly replace the electrons in the wire by collecting electrons from the earth through ground rods that are connected to the energizer. Brilliant. The shock delivered to the animal when it touches the wire can only be as great as the number of electrons the energizer can draw up from the earth in that same instant. If the ground system does not have enough ground rods to collect electrons, or if the contact is poor between the ground rod and the soil, the shock will be significantly reduced, no matter how well designed the rest of the electric fence system may be. I have seen more than a few farmers give up on electric fencing after spending huge amounts of money replacing or fixing energizers in the mistaken belief that the soil was too dry for the electric fence to work, when in fact a few extra ground rods would have solved the problem. Don't get cheap on ground rods. A good rule of thumb is to use one ground rod for every two joules of stored energy. If the soil is particularly dry or is a poor conductor, as is the case with sandy, rocky, or low mineral soils, more ground rods may be needed. In a worst case scenario, you can use a more specialized grounding system in which some of the soil around the ground rod is replaced with a conductive clay medium. Placing ground rods where moisture can reach them, such as along the drip line of a roof or periodically watering the soil around the ground rods, improves the grounding of the energizer. Yeah, just water that shit. Just watering my ground, no, my ground, ground knobs, my ground, ground rods, ground rod. Hmm, got some pictures on this one too. Ground rods must be made of a material that will not be resistant to electrical flow. Metal loses its conductivity as it rusts. The rust acts as an insulator, and even thinly uh, electroplated rods or painted rods will lose their conductivity as they rust, so galvanized ground rods are the best option. Go galvanized. Use a heavy gauge insulated lead-out cable, a thick, highly conductive insulated wire used to conduct, connect the energizer to the ground rods and or the electric fence of a connection must travel through buildings uh, underground or across gateways connect the ground rods to the energizer wherever it touches buildings, soil, or water pipes to insulate them from electric charges. In addition, be sure to ground the energizer some distance from water lines and milking sheds so the flow of electrons around the ground rods does not induce an electric charge in buildings where it will affect milking cows or your home plumbing. To protect the expensive energizer of lightning, uh, Excuse me. To protect the expensive energizer, if lightning strikes the fence, attach ground rods to a lightning diverter. You can use the same grounding system for the energizer and the lightning diverter. In high lightning strike areas, add lightning diverters to your fence in spots where they can be ground in damp soil. The most effective ground rod pattern to disperse a lightning strike is a crow's foot design. The ideal spacing between ground rods is 10 feet. Test the quality of the ground system this way. Short out the fence to less than two kilovolts, at least 300 feet from the energizer, so the short does not induce false readings on the ground rods. Then place an independent ground rod three feet from the last ground rod hooked to the energizer and push it at least eight inches into the soil. Connect this independent rod into the ground rods via a digital volt, uh, voltmeter. The voltmeter should read less than 200 volts. If it doesn't, add more ground rods to the ground system. At no time should you feel an electric shock if you touch a ground rod or the soil around it with your hands. Plug-in energizers are the least trouble prone and the most maintenance free, but portable energizers that can run off deep cycle marine batteries, car batteries are not designed for repeated almost complete drawdown, provide flexibility in areas without power and offer quick backup during a power outage. Solar powered fences recharge such batteries, but during the shortest winter days and during long periods of overcast weather, they may need to be switched occasionally with a second battery for recharging. Let's look at this picture or two on the left. Um, the crow's foot design attached to a lightning diverter is the most effective ground rod pattern for dispersing a lightning strike. Space ground rods approximately 10 feet apart. That doesn't look like 10 feet each. 
but I guess the whole thing's much bigger. It just doesn't look like 10 feet. I guess it's my scale sense of scale. So looks like 10 inches. Mm. But no, that wouldn't make sense. 10 inches. <laughs> then the fence would be 10 inches tall. All right. <clears throat> You're welcome. Moving on. A cow can complete the circuit of an electric fence. The shock she receives is caused by the electrical charge, electrons traveling through her body to reach the ground. So otherwise the electricity isn't even going through the fence. It has to be grounded. So it's like one of those things where if a tree falls in the forest, but no one's there to look at it, is it, did it fall? It's like, is the fence electric? No, until something touches it and then it becomes electric. It's kind of cool. Permanent wires. Use only 12 and a half gauge or thicker wire for permanent fencing because it carries current significantly farther than lighter gauge wire. A 16, 16 gauge wire has three times more electrical resistance than a 12 and a half gauge wire. The height and number of wires required for effective livestock control depends on the class of livestock being contained in the fence application. Hello, Rockman. Hey, not on the book. I, a single wire placed 32 inches from the ground is sufficient to contain cow, calf, pears, yearlings, and bulls on all interior fence divisions. Hey, wrong man. Yeah. Hey. <laughs> this height minimizes losses in current caused by tall grass and allows cattle to gra easily graze under the wire to prevent grass from growing over the fence line. If you want your cattle to graze under the wire to keep it clean, the grass should not carry a current, which makes it unpalatable. This height allows <laughs> I'll say this height allows cows to graze ahead of the cows by walking under the wire, providing them with access to the best nutrition. Their mother's milk and the security of the herd prevent calves from straying. Two strands of wire placed 18 and 36 inches above the ground prevent calves from escaping and even contain bulls that can see and smell cows as long as they are not in adjunct pastures, adjacent pastures, excuse me. This is also the ideal fence for alleys and other high pressure areas. For property boundary areas, I prefer two wires spaced at 18 and 36 inches or three wires spaced at 12, 24, and 36 inches. Should the power be cut off temporarily, this provides a greater physical barrier and prevents calves from running onto roadways or onto the neighbor's land. This wire spaced spacing also discourages unwanted dogs from entering the property and harassing your cattle because of the high likelihood that they will receive a painful and memorable shock while sniffing or at it, <coughs> sniffing at or attempting to cross under the fence. Water site coral corrals are ideally suited to two or three strand fences, particularly if you use them as capture and collection sites for treating and sorting cattle. I prefer to use wood or unelectrified wire around permanent water troughs, however, to prevent electricity from bleeding into the water. Last, weaning fences are ideally constructed with two or three strands of electrified wire. See chapter three for a detailed discussion of weaning across an electric fence. Some particularly dry, rocky, and frozen soils do not conduct sufficient electricity to shock cattle when they touch the fence, even if the elect uh, energizer is grounded properly. In such cases, you may need to use an earth ground return system in which you hang a ground or earth wire onto your electric fence approximately 10 inches below the live wire, or between live wires if you are constructing a multiple strand fence. When animals lean into the electric fence, they will receive the full effect of the electric shock when they make a connection between the live and ground wires because the ground wire completes the circuit by carrying the electric charge directly back to the energizer rather than the circuit being completed through the soil. This ground wire does not require insulators where it is attached to the post, but does need to be separate continuous wire connected back to the ground rods at the energizer. It should also be grounded to additional ground rods every three quarters of a mile to safeguard against potential lightning strikes and to drain away any induced current that builds up on the ground wire through the process known as electrostatic induction. An electrical charge is produced in the ground wire due to the proximity of the electrical charge in the wire carrying the current without the wires actually touching. This type of fence requires more, much more work to install and maintain because of the potential for shorts between ground and live wires. So there's a picture below. A cow completes the electric circuit in an earth ground return system 
the bottom wire is not electrified but connects directly to the grounding system attached to the energizer. When the cow touches both the top wire and the ground wire below it, the electric charge in the top wire is transferred to the lower wire through the cow's body, causing the cow to experience a shock. Mm. Moving on to the next page. Ooh, we have a huge multi-page chart here of tying wire knots. To revolutionize your experience of working with high tensile wire, learn to tie wire knots by hand. Using crimping tools and wire cutters can be a discouraging and frustrating experience, but once you learn to tie wire knots and break wire by hand, working with high tensile wire becomes a pleasure. Some electric fence suppliers teach these knots and host electric fencing workshops, which are well worth attending. Practice lessons are best, but if they're not available in your area, here's an overview of how to break a wire by hand, how to tie a wire directly to a strain post, and then break off the excess wire by hand, by hand how to tie a strain insulator to a strain post by hand, and how to make two different wire joints that allow you to tie two wire ends together by hand. Do it by hand. Cutting a wire by breaking it. Um, so this is a big chart on this stuff, on all this wire stuff. Did you ever think you'd be learning how to tie wire together? Maybe if you thought ahead to fencing. Okay, what are you doing? Scratching at some metal. Wow. Hope I don't get rained on. So cutting a wire by breaking it. Hold the wire in both hands with your hands about a foot apart. Bring your hands together. The wire will naturally form a loop. Pull your hands apart without letting the loop open and the loop will tighten until it pinches or kinks. Uh, give it a good hard kink. Force the loop open again by straightening the wire and then re-kink it. With a couple of kinks the wire will break. The more rigid the wire the faster it will break. So we have one, two, and three. Forms an upside down heart or it kind of looks like bowl balls, frankly, in step three. Tying off to a post. This knot, see top of page 73, is used when tying a wire to direct a wire directly to a post. Uh, the next page, we'll see the picture for it. Um, when making wire wraps when making wire wraps around the strain end of the wire, the end that will hold the tension and pulls against the post when the fence is complete. Kink the tail end of the wire, the end with which you tie the knot, into a handle. Then use the handle, then use this handle as a crank to tighten the wraps around the strain end. The handle also allows you to easily break off excess wire when you have made several wraps around the strain end with the wire handle. The wire is ready to be broken off using the following wire break method. To break off the handle, the tail handle, bend the handle back on itself so it passes over the strain end as though unwrapping, except that the length of the handle should remain parallel to the strain end as it passes over the wire to create a tight kink. See middle illustration at top of page 73. Instead of remaining perpendicular to the strain wire, which would actually cause the tight wire wraps around the strain end to begin unwrapping. Once you have created the kink shown in the middle illustration, the handle can be cranked alongside the knot until the wire tail handle breaks off, creating a completed self-locking knot shown in the illustration on the right. The combination of kinking the wire in the manner described above and then cranking the handle will break off the wire tail so close to the knot that you will be able to run your hand over the knot without feeling a barb. That's better than cutting off the excess wire with wire cutters, which leaves a little barb that livestock and people can get caught on when they get shocked by the fence. Using wire cutters is also slower and more strenuous than breaking the wire by hand. Awesome. So we have this picture on page 73. A self-locking tie-off wire knot for a strainer post. The tail end is bent into a handle shape to facilitate wire wrapping. Wrap the tie end around the strain end with the handle left kink the handle back on itself before cranking the wire handle alongside the knot to break off the excess wire middle and complete the knot on the right. Hello Rock Band again. Hey, it's on the book. Rock Band. Right. Tying on, I'm moving his leg so I can read. Tying on a strain insulator. 
Tie a strain insulator to the wire by making several wraps around the wire and the tie end. Again, make a little crank to facilitate wire wrapping. Break off the tail with the same reverse kink, direct, reverse direction kink and crank motion. We have the strain insulator over here on the right. Notice, note the series of wire wraps used to attach the electric wire. Tying a wire join. There are two effective wire joins. A wire join must create as much contact as possible from one wire end to the other. A join that has only a single point of contact shown below will be prone to shorts and provide too little contact between the two join wires to transfer the full current from one wire to the other. I'm reading this while fighting with Rockman on the chair. He's like biting into my hand. <laughs> Okay, full current from wire to the other, still fighting Rockman. Much like a kink in the garden hose will reduce the flow of water beyond the kink. Nope, oh, Rockman is back. Rockman. Rock, no, I gotta read. I doesn't understand reading. A kink in a garden hose, um, much like a kink in the garden hose will reduce the flow of water beyond the kink. To ensure that there is sufficient contact between the two wires you are tying together, use a reef knot or a figure eight knot. See below. In both wire joins, the excess wire ends are wrapped around the wire and broken off after creating a reef or figure eight knot. Of the two joins, the figure eight knot has more wire contact. Another uh, <coughs> unusual and beneficial feature of this knot is that the slack gain when the wire knot is tightened will be squeezed out during the tail ends of the wire knot instead of slackening the tension in the joined wire, causing the tail ends to get longer while the length of the joined wire being tensioned remains exactly the same. When joining a wire break, the slack required to tie the knot can usually be gathered by loosening the permanent wire tightener, a small device used to provide tension to an electric wire by wrapping the slack onto the device with the help of another tool, called a permanent wire tightener handle. If you do this, move the wire tightener to a new location on the wire. Retightening the wire tightener in an old kink weakens the wire and risks breaking it. The kinked wire in the old location will straighten out when the wire is retightened and will not be weakened. Boy, I am literally tying myself in knots reading this. Okay. A poor wire join with only one point of contact between the two wire ends below. So we don't want that. Should be an X over that. Maybe I'll draw an X over it with a red pen for the photo. Why not? A reef knot below, and then a figure eight knot. So there's so much more contact going on with those ones. Um, posts and braces. The wires of an electric fence do not require a lot of tension because they do not act as a physical barriers. Uh, but there must be sufficient tension to hold the wires up off the ground so they provide a psychological barrier and carry the shock at the proper height above the ground. Thus, electric fences can be built with far fewer posts and much lighter braces than a standard fence, and the fence line does not need to be as straight. Obstacles such as deep gullies, rough terrain, and steep ridges can be circumnavigated within reason as long as the insulators and wire are always placed on the outside of the curve so the wire pulls into the post rather than pulling the insulators away from the posts. The traditional H-brace top is necessary only in soft ground on high tension fences or if you are using multiple wires with very long spans between braces. An angle brace can be used for medium tension braces, uh, medium tension fences, a four foot stay block, a piece of timber that is placed into the ground to brace against the pressure of a post or angle stay, also known as a bed log, should be dug horizontally into the ground against which the angle stay, the angled post used to support a post against the tension pulling on the post, is braced as shown here, middle illustration. So we have these pictures on the left. Traditional H brace, the angle brace, and then the bed log brace. Oh, interesting. Um, below. The fence post is notched to prevent the angle stay from slipping up, and the angle stay is rammed into place between the block and the post. The bedlock brace is the simplest and quickest brace to build. It is ideal for most corner and strainer posts and posts in a fence line that hold tension or strain of the wire on the fence. On low to, tension, low to medium tension fences, all that is required is a four foot long stay block or bed log, which is dug horizontally into the ground at the base of the strainer post on the side of the tension and packed firmly into place as shown below. The top of the bed log should sit just below, uh, beneath ground level. 
Post spacing varies according to topography to allow the wire to follow the contours of the ground. On flat ground, one post every 50 to 60 feet is sufficient. Alternatively, posts can be spaced 100 feet apart and a fiberglass spacer used between each to eliminate sagging, wagging, <laughs> sagging, <laughs> uh, eliminate wire sagging and to hold apart multiple wires. Livestock producers considering organic certification for their land and livestock should be aware that the chemicals used to treat fence posts are becoming increasingly tightly regulated or even prohibited by most organic associations. If you are considering organic certification, please refer to the information on page 75 on approved alternative fence post for organic producers. Mm. Insulators. This is like a picture a page or multiple pictures a page. So we have a swivel lock insulator here on the right. And down below, create a temporary gate in electric fence line by removing the wire from its insulators along a short section and propping up the wire with notched PVC pipes that fit over two of the posts. Interesting. And then the cows just go right through there. It's like a little magical portal to a new pasture. Insulators, unless you use plastic or insole timber posts, in salt timber posts, I don't know. You will require some form of insulator. Note that insulator posts are made of high density, non conductive eucalyptus or acacia wood that is so hard that it does not require chemical preservatives, hence, their popularity among certified organic producers. They are a product of Gallagher Animal Management Systems, which has a comprehensive worldwide network of electric fence dealers. I strongly recommend using high quality insulators because they are more resistant to ultraviolet degradation and so it will last much longer. The wires you the wire should be able to move freely through the insulator to absorb shocks in the event of an impact on the wire from a fallen tree or cattle running into it. Some electric fencing companies have come out with a new insulator style lo called a swivel lock insulator. Um sold as power lock insulators by Gallagher Animal Management Systems. That gives the farmer more flexibility by swiveling the wire holding mechanism in this insulator, you can easily remove wire while the fence is hot and under tension. Pinlock insulators sold by most electric fence companies also allow you to remove the wire from the insulator, but with some difficulty and often not without receiving a shock from the wire. The sw well, we don't want that. The swiveling, uh, the swivel lock mechanism of insulators like the power lock allows you to drop the wire to the ground on interior single strand electric fences so you can drive over them with equipment. Alternatively, you can prop up a single wire with a long stick or notched PVC pipe to create a temporary makeshift gate anywhere you need one. The diameter of the PVC pipe is greater than the diameter of the post. Oh. Rocket's bird hunting. Knock it off, Rocket. Go look for rats. Creating a very stable temporary gate post tall enough to enable cattle and equipment to pass underneath it. This gate thing. This gives your pasture rotations an added degree of flexibility and allows you to sort out or add cattle to the herd even if a permanent gate is not in a convenient location. If your cattle are trained to follow your ATV, discussed in detail in Training a Herd to Pasture Moves, this chapter and teaching a herd to follow in chapter 9 simply drive under the propped up wire and call them through the temporary gate to show them its location. With this method, you don't even have to touch the wires or turn off the power to create a temporary gate. driving around on your little golf cart. Or you could use that opportunity to get some exercise, right? Get some gloves. A simple pair of insulated rubber gloves from the heart. This is a little mini section, just a couple paragraphs. Uh, get some gloves. A simple pair of insulated rubber gloves from the hardware store, such as the type sold for handling fuel is essential for working around electric fences. When the gloves are dry, they insulate against electric shock, allowing you to lift the wire over your ATV, assuming you are using single strand wire. The gloves come in handy for putting up portable fencing if you choose to work with live wires instead of connecting them afterward, as you might if you have a wire break and want to stop cattle from traveling any further. Insulated rubber gloves also give you the option to repair live fences without disconnecting the power beyond the section you need to fix or modify. Wrap the hand grips of your permanent wire tightener handle with 
heavy duty electrical tape for added protection so you can loosen any wire sections that need work. Sounds badass. All right, main section, swivel locking insulators also, we're finishing this on swivel locking insulators. Um, they also allow you to access water alleys from anywhere in the pasture by simply propping up the wire. You don't have to build a multitude of permanent gates for each paddock subdivision. They are particularly useful when using portable electric fencing to change the geometry and size of your paddock rotations in response to grass growth rates and seasonal weather conditions. Um, I mean, we were getting taught so much here, so fast. Permanent gates. Permanent gates built into your permanent electric fences. Uh, permanent gates built into your permanent electric fences should be constructed with cattle movements, not vehicles, in mind. Locate gates where cattle will naturally travel, such as in the corner of a pasture and in the bottom of a gully. A gate in the middle of a straight fence line or at the top of a hill causes cattle who are lazy by nature to scatter sideways instead of going through the gate. Put gates in locations that naturally draw your sight lines so you can see from a distance whether they are open or closed. A gate placed just in front of a 90 degree bend in a road fa uh, facing a grove of trees or with a second fence running parallel to it confuses cattle because they cannot see whether the gate is open. Instead of being drawn forward by a clear visual path, they mill around, bunch together, or scatter. Insulate gates. He said that cattle are lazy by nature. That's kind of funny. <laughs> they are in a way, aren't they? I wonder how much that is the domesticated breed, though, compared to wild cattle. But wild cattle don't really go through gates, so this is all unproven. Insulate gates at their hinge, and so they are live only when closed. A live open gate not only loves to bite the person trying to untangle it, but also snaps loudly if it's on the ground, scaring the cattle and stopping them from passing through. When you connect the wires on either side of a gate, you have two options, overhead connections and insulated varied connections. In areas that get severe ground frost, the insulating plastic layer under, uh, around underground wires will crack over time because of the expanding and contracting ground. In all climates, rodents are prone to gnaw through the insulating layer of underground wires. If voltage begins to drop in a fence line, ooh, that's a nasty shock that they could could they get the shock the rat? Calm down, Rocket. Um, in all climates, rodents are prone to If voltage drop begins to drop in a fence line, underground wires and gateways are often the cause. Burying the insulated underground wire in a short selection of poly pipe or garden hose can help extend its life and protect it from ground compaction caused by vehicles driving over it. Overhead wires require less maintenance unless someone snags them with tall machinery. Portable electric fencing. A single strand of portable wires is sufficient for most portable electric fencing divisions. If you design the permanent fence grid with portable fencing in mind, it will be narrow enough for one reel of portable wire to span the permanent wires. Insulated geared reels are a most useful invention because they allow you to swiftly wind up live wires while protecting you from any risk of electric shock. Most polywire and polytape come in orange or white. Although white is somewhat more visible during summer and at night, it becomes invisible in snow, making the late fall and winter grazing a nightmare. Orange polywire, which is easily seen in snow and fairly visible during the rest of the year, is a better choice. I prefer polywire to polytape because it does not twist as much and rolls up more compactly. Until recently, fiberglass posts were the most commonly used portable fence posts. They allow you to adjust the height of the insulator on a post, and they fit easily into a quaver, quiver, see box at right, for quick portable fence moves. You even get a freaking Legolas style quiver. Oh my god, you're going to see it in a second when we get to that page. Um, so, they easily fit into a quiver, see box at right for quick portable fence moves, but if anything hits the wire, the insulators have a tendency to pull off the posts and disappear. To avoid shattering the posts when you pound them, you have to use a driver cap and hammer, which you also must carry with you. In addition, ultraviolet solar radiation causes fiberglass to deteriorate, limiting its lifespan and making it brittle and splintery. Make your own quiver. A quiver for your portable electric fence posts is easily constructed by gluing a four inch sewer cap to one end of a three foot section of four inch diameter PVC pipe. Then cut a couple of holes through which to tie a rope 
or strap for carrying. Cool. But you could also make one out of cow leather. Step in insulated portable metal posts are gaining in popularity. Step in insulated portable metal posts are gaining in popularity. They have insulated hooks or loops to hold the wire and no tools are needed to put them in the ground. A quick push with your boot heel is all it takes. This makes them quite versatile, although their extra weight and slightly bulky design makes them heavier than fiberglass. Their wire loops and tread-in design are prone to entanglement if carried in a quiver, though they do fine in an ATV box. Portable fencing works best as cross-fencing between permanent wires. The permanent wires form corridors subdivided by portable wires, like the rungs on a ladder. One wire is set up beyond, behind the cattle and one in front. I also like to set up the next day's grazing subdivision so there are always two wires protecting the ungrazed grass from trampling cattle. Putting up the next day's wire ensures against a failed portable wire costing you many days worth of carefully rationed grass and prevents an escaped herd from spreading manure, aka fly hatcheries, across future grazing, sub, uh, grazing divisions. It is not necessary to put up a second fence beyond the cattle because the grass has already been eaten on that side. If the portable fence fails, there is less incentive for the cattle to go back and eat the grass because it won't be as fresh as the food in their current paddock. In addition, the grass behind the cattle has fresh manure piles scattered throughout the day, which will begin hatching flies in just a few days. With all their biting and buzzing, the flies are irritating and so function as a sort of secondary back fence. Mm. Picture below, portable cross-fencing subdivides corridors formed by permanent wires. Here the cattle are grazing from right to left, with flies hatching from the pi manure piles in the grazed area behind them, acting as a secondary back fence, and the ungrazed grass ahead of them subdivided for more than one day's grazing. And we got our trees off to the side. With some birds in them. Birds in them. All right. Continuing on, training cattle to respect electric fences. That's right, cows. You must respect the fence, cattle. Must respect the fence. Cattle must be trained to respect the psychological barrier provided by an electric fence. The place to start is a contained pen rather than out in a big field. To train a herd that is unaccustomed to electric fences or to train cattle that are new to the farm, put the animals in a situation where they are all forced to get shocked by the wire. A strong multiple wire training fence in a corral or training pen works best. Place the fence through the middle of the pen so the cattle are forced to make an inconvenient detour to get from their food to the water. For added effect, put something on the wire to attract the cattle to it, such as a colorful ribbon or something aromatic and tasty like peanut butter or molasses. Oh, that is just mean. It will be obvious when the animals learn to respect the wires and maintain a safe distance from it, and within a few days they will be ready to leave the training pen. Once they learn this lesson, they will never forget it, no matter how flimsy and thin, thin a wire may look to you. The occasional accidental tickle they receive from when grazing underneath the electric fence seems to serve as a sufficient reminder of the fence's unpleasant bite. I have seen several instances where a malfunctioning energizer or electrical short cut all the electrical current to the fence, but it went unnoticed by the cattle for weeks before any of the animals tested the wire and crossed the single unelectrified wire containing them. A hard lesson. The first time I turned cattle loose behind an electric fence, it was a catastrophe. I had carefully divided a huge hay field with a long network of portable electric wires to ration the grass. Quite proudly, I turned out 300 uninitiated cows in the first pasture subdivision. Reading, Rockman. Untrained to calm pasture moves and completely unaware of the psychological barrier this electric fence was supposed to present, they rapidly stampeded through the entire hay field in a flurry of excitement and wire-busting enthusiasm. I spent the next two days collecting polywire, portable posts, and insulators from every corner of the trampled hay field that I was attempting to ration. It wasn't the cow's fault, though I'm sure my language at the time would have suggested otherwise. I had forgotten the most important lesson of electric fencing in my enthusiasm over its effectiveness and flexibility. Train the cattle. They had not learned to be afraid of the powerful bite of the little orange and silver wires. Silver wires. Training pen below. This training pen is partially subdivided by an electric fence to train cattle to respect the psychological barrier of such a fence. Note the flags on the fence to attract curious cows. Hey, little baby cow. <laughs> 
Time for training. Isn't it, Rockman? You're untrainable, beast. All right. Um, I was going to say something. Well, that's so funny, though. But, like, definitely train your cows. Oh, it's like... I was thinking about um, the video game, like, that, those farming video games. What's the most popular one? Animal Crossing, I think. And there's, like... Basically, you just kind of hang out and build your animal farm. And it's like, at first I was thinking, like, those people should be doing this in real life. But then I was also thinking just now, with this, like, stage of, of like, training your cattle to respect fencing, there's so many stages, so many things you do. We should make this whole process into a video game. Wow, I'm like having a real, huh, I like just realized this, instead of a training, like I wanted to read this to learn, and for anyone who would like to listen and look at the pictures, they can learn too, but I've been thinking about how to actually present this like in a way for people that they could like spend a little money on and learn this whole process and be able to do it right. And at first it's like you could do a, a sort of series of videos or something like that because that's how people like to learn, right? Through videos now. Um, and you can present information, you know, pictures worth a thousand words. Well, a picture with a bunch of words, you can go pretty far. But video games are almost even more powerful. and You could turn this whole experience into a video game that was built you know, it's kind of around the Animal Crossing model. You could even introduce other animals like pigs and, and stuff later. Um, or have bison or, my god, you could you could have the most crazy farm, but it would all be based on real life and all the, it just seems like there are so many steps and processes and decisions you make based on weather. You could like start in different climates. You could have a simulator game for this whole thing that would train you. Just like, you know, the pilots in the military have flight simulators. You can have cattle simulators. Hold my beer. Like, I think this is... Maybe that is the way to go. Because we already have a bunch of people who've learned how to play Animal Crossing, right? Well, this could be, like, that real-life version, and it'll provide that sweetness and the serenity, and maybe some of those people will then be like, wait, I can... I've learned all the skills I need, um, you know, by this book buy the video game and you can pretty much learn to do this in real life all right understanding the goals of pasture rotation on the next page your grazing philosophies during summer and winter are opposite because you are trying to achieve a different goal in each season in winter grass is food for the cattle but in summer the cattle are your tool for managing the grass the goal of summer grazing is to create the tallest possible grazing reserve without any of the grass becoming overly mature so it can be rationed during the winter. Calculate how many days it will take before your cattle need to regraze your summer pastures to prevent the grass from getting too mature. This period is the length of the grassing, grazing rotation. Because of pasture recovery time changes throughout the year, it is best to create a written week-by-week -week grazing plan for the entire year. This helps you to determine how many acres you need to graze each day and therefore how many days you will spend in each pasture division. You can't simply eyeball it every morning when you go into the pasture. See chapter 25 to learn how to calculate an appropriate grazing schedule and to learn how to calculate the amount of grass in the grazing reserve uh, so you can adjust your herd numbers to fit the size of the grazing reserve on your farm. Uh, fencing versus shepherds. This is a mini section. Until recently, we used shepherds to keep our domestic herds bunched together and migrating as a group. Although shepherds have largely been replaced by fencing in North America and Europe, they continue to be used elsewhere. And in North America, they are making a comeback, managing extremely large herds and low density, low stock density rangeland. A single shepherd can easily eliminate all the fence and water site infrastructure investments and maintenance costs related to fencing while still maintaining an intensive rotational grazing program. Shepherding allows far more flexibility in managing the migration patterns of cattle because paddocks divisions do not restrict movement. Paddock divisions do not restrict movement. Right. See chapter 9 for a more detailed discussion of shepherding. I'm excited for that chapter, and that is like an interesting possibility. 
right? Definitely more hands-on though. The beauty of using a portable electric fence inside a permanent electric fence grid is that the portable wires allow you to change the size of the paddocks over the course of the grazing season as the grass speeds up its growth and slows down or becomes dormant. One size of paddock does not have to accommodate every condition throughout the year. During the growth peak, it may take up to 30 days to make a complete rotation around your entire land to prevent the grass from getting too mature, but by fall, the rotation may slow to about 60 days. After the dormant season begins, the grass has to be rationed daily until the next season's growth starts, so you may need more than 160 paddock subdivisions for thorough rationing. Tip: The more pasture divisions you create, the less grass reserve is lost to trampling. A cow's feet consume five times more grass than her mouth. Holy shit, really? Hmm. For example, a 40-acre pasture may feed a small herd of cattle for two weeks if the herd grazes as a single unit, but it may last a month or more if you ration it out in daily slices. More pasture divisions allow you to maintain a consistent grass quality from day to day during the dormant season because each day the cattle begin with a fresh slice of highly quality grass. This is very important to your herd's health, fertility, body condition scores, and the metabolic rates because it allows nutritional intake to remain consi consistent from day to day. If the grass is not rationed daily, the cattle will top graze the best grass first, and remaining grass will steadily decrease in quality until the herd is ready to move into the next pasture. Also, because daily rotations force the cattle to graze each slice thoroughly in a single grazing session, in winter, far less grass will remain buried and wasted under the snow after the herd moves on to the next slice, thereby allowing your grass supply to last longer. And this is what I've heard from, uh, it was a YouTube video with, um, what's his name, Joel Salatin. He's like one of the internet's premier grass uh, fed cow farmers and he said everything changed when he started moving his cows once a day like every day move your cows every day is the winning move and rock band is here on top of the book again i'm not putting up a fight this time because i only have a tiny bit to go on a page and he's not covering it but rock man you're gonna have to get up as soon as i want to change pages okay so every day you got to move, move moving your cows every day that's just the way to do it mm -hmm. That's your job, right? And it's exciting to think of these things on a large scale, isn't it, Rockman? Because you can have a lot of people living together, having a great time, and frankly, with a bunch of people, this all becomes a lot less work. Like, one person doing this becomes is like a job, right? But if you have a team of people, and you have a ton, a huge herd, you know, a team of people, you're gonna have a lot of time off between all of you. And you can have written logs of everything and communication on what's going on. You're a team of people designing the greatest herd on you know, the planet is your goal to like out herd all the other herds, right? Hey, hey, don't hit the mic with your tail. Um Rockman is up. Portable electric fencing enables you to realize your changing grazing goals if your livestock watering options permit it but you won't need 160 water sites to make it through the winter because you don't need a back fence to protect the regrowth from cattle mouths and feet. You simply ration your way outward from the water sites and the livestock walk back across what has already been grazed to get to water. <clears throat> Managing summer's grass excess. In an ideal world where grass grows at a consistent rate and cows graze at your grazing calculations and with your calc grazing calculations in mind, Careful planning should be enough to create the best winter grazing reserve and to prevent grass from becoming overly mature during summer. But life in the real world is rarely this simple. Even the cows increasing nutritional demands during summer cannot compensate for the incredible grass flush that often occurs. In order to manage this flush without ending up with an excess of overly mature grass, some producers make hay. It is far more economical, however, to vary livestock numbers on your farm in response to the seasons. More animals in summer and fewer in winter. You can accomplish this without buying off-farm stalkers by keeping your yearlings through the following summer, which effectively doubles the mouths that feed during the growing season. 
For example, if you have a herd of 100 brood cows, you will have only 100 cow-calf pairs to graze through winter on your grazing reserve, but you will have 100 cows and 100 yearlings during the summer growing season. And you will also have your open and coal cows to refatten on the spring grass flush before you take them to auction or direct market them as hamburger. Furthermore, selling your calves as yearlings the following fall, especially if you grass, finish, and direct market them by winter, allows you to produce the same pounds of beef per acre of grass with fewer brood cows, so winter herd size is even further reduced without affecting your beef output. Sounds like a pretty important concept. I think they were touching on earlier with the timing of your cows. <clears throat> but I think one of the lessons was there's there can be a lot of potential benefits to holding on to your calves and using them um, over the course of the year and this is one of the ways is because they're offsetting the numbers at the right time uh, for the grass because there's going to be more grass at certain times of the year so you want more cows at that time more mouths to feed pasture rotation herd migration in your own backyard Daily pasture moves are the key to managing a herd's impact on the land. Cattle and grass evolve together as a consequence of the herd's migration, which impacts the grass and soil briefly, but intensely before the herd moves on. As few as 24 grazing subdivisions, also known as cells, in a pasture rotation will prevent nutrients from being exported from the pasture to water sites, shady spots, and favorite bedding sites. Although the manure will be evenly distributed across the field, the frequency of pasture moves in a 24-cell grazing rotation is still not enough to prevent pasture deterioration and an onslaught of weeds. It takes daily pasture moves to mimic the natural migration pattern and create self-sustaining and self-improving pastures. And in a daily pasture rotation schedule, the cattle, herd's changing, uh, the cattle herd changes its grazing habits. When cattle have access to large pastures for extended periods of time, they spread out and graze independently, but in a pasture rotation where space is limited and the herd moves frequently, the cattle begin to behave as a group, much like a flock of migrating birds or caribou. Members of the herd become very competitive to secure access to fresh grass each day. They stay together, grazing around the pasture as a group, neck to neck, shoulder to shoulder. Their selectiveness disappears. Rather than idly searching for the best mouthfuls, they grab what is in front of their noses and move on to keep pace with the herd. All grass species are grazed evenly, and inedible plants that would have been carefully avoided before are indiscriminately trampled instead. Manure falls evenly behind the herd as it grazes, much to the benefit of the grass underfoot. Moving the cattle also becomes easier. As the cattle grow accustomed to grazing as a group, the herd becomes their place of security. During a herd move, the cattle eagerly follow each other to avoid being left behind, whereas if cattle are accustomed to grazing independently, they are less concerned about keeping up with the herd during pasture moves. Training the herd for pasture moves. Conventional search and gather pasture moves typically involve droves of cowboys the bulk of the day and a big dose of patience to get all of the cattle through the gate, but cows are remarkably trainable and thrive on the routine of frequent pasture moves. They learn to anticipate a move and become eager to pass through the gate to fresh grass. Much as a dog salivates and comes running in response to his rattling food bowl, cattle are equally trainable to certain cues. A come cow call that you can use every time you call your cattle through the gate will excite the herd to follow you to new pastures. During the move, stay ahead of them, either on foot or on an ATV, and they will quickly learn to associate following you with reaching their next grazing location. Don't let them pass you. Try to slow uh, them down until you train them to walk behind you in the next pasture so you can control the direction and they can calmly filter through the tight gate without flattening it in their excitement. So you're training your herd just like you train a dog. When you train them to follow you, don't just take them through the gate before you stop calling. Take them to the best, most lush part of the pasture so they get a really good reward for coming and keep calling until everyone makes it through the gate. When all the animals are accounted for, give them an all okay call such as pow, which sounds very different than the come cow call. After a while, they will know this means that the herd is complete, everyone is safe, and they have reached their destination. This trains them to continue to pay attention to you until they hear your all okay signal. Consistency is key. If you are predictable, they learn to obey your signals because they know what the signals mean. Over time, they will learn to follow you until you reach whatever destination you have picked for them such as a faraway, faraway paddock, paddock a mile up the highway or the center of the sort of the sort 
corral on processing or the center of the sort corral on processing day. Just don't disappoint them at their destination. A treat at the center of the sort corral, like a few flakes of hay, will reinforce that your calls were worth following. Food is a powerful motivator. This training is also the foundation of shepherding, in which cattle are trained to follow a cue to the next unfenced, unfenced grazing area and back and forth to, the, to a central water site once per day, even if it is a long distance away. For more on shepherding, see chapter 9. Oh, getting tired. Um, here's a subsection below. Training for a pasture moves. Training for pasture moves. Pasture moves. A case in point. To illustrate how effective this training can be, I'll share an experience I had with a small herd of 150 cows just three weeks before I started using come cow calls in combination with a follow me training cue. When it was time for the herd to move, I attached the mineral feeder to the back of the ATV and pulled it to the next pasture while calling to the cattle. I like using the mineral feeder dragged behind an ATV as the following as the follow me cue because it prevents the cattle from associating you or the ATV with the cue so you don't get mobbed every time you enter the pasture. <laughs> and it is a visible, familiar object that remains with the herd at all times. After all, the mineral feeder is central to the cattle's lives in every pasture they use, so why not train the cattle to accompany it to the next pasture when it is time to move? On this particular occasion, the herd had time to leave a large 80-acre pasture of bushland through a narrow, complicated gate configuration at the top of a long slope at the far end of pasture. The cattle then had to walk uphill through knee-deep lush grass and cross almost a mile of lush grassed fields to get to their next grazing paddock in the rotation. It was as complicated as it sounds. With only one other person available to help, they were anticipating a long, frustrating day of old-fashioned cattle moving. But once the mineral feeder started rattling behind the ATV and I started calling, our freshly trained herd of cattle followed me up the hill, through all the complicated gates, and across some of the most delicious-looking grass this side of heaven, all without stopping. They just plodded along until I, until I stopped to unhook the mineral feeder. The fellow who was helping close each gate behind the herd and walked along, feeling let down by the lack of old-fashioned rodeo excitement. What stood out for me was how willing the cattle were willing uh, to follow my training cue despite distractions after only a few short weeks of this routine. It also illustrates how training cues in a calm, predictable training routine can compensate for even the most rudimentary and poorly designed fencing infrastructure. Cattle are creatures of habit, but they are certainly not dumb. Managing the calving season on pasture. Like deer, cows have the habit of hiding their newborn calves in the grass to conceal them from predators until the calves are strong enough to follow the herd. Although calving on grass during the warmth of summer increases the vigor of calves and good herd selection eliminates calves and poor mothering instincts, eliminates calves, cows rather, with poor mothering instincts, you nevertheless risk some calves being left behind during daily pasture moves. What do you do when the pasture rotation causes newborn calves to be left behind or cows to break through gates to retrieve their young? And what if you find calves starving to death while they patiently wait for their mothers after the herd moves on or being eaten by predators after being left? Calving during an ongoing grazing rotation would seem to spell disaster for newborn calves hiding in the grass. Uh, yet everything we have learned from the herd regarding grass management and animal health suggests that the migration must continue. It cannot be suspended for the 42-day calving season. The herd must move on to avoid overgrazing and the migration around the pastures must continue to keep mature grass from forming in pastures that are not reached. Likewise, keeping the grass in its S-curve of maximum grass productivity, say, see page 60, and preparing the winter grazing reserve both depend on the constant movement of the herd. The herd must move on to avoid nutrient transfer, parasites, and diseases. Even the newborn calves, which fare so well when calving on grass, become prone to disease through oral fecal transfers and flies hatching from manure piles if the migration stalls. A balance must be struck to successfully manage calving on grass. Wild herds manage their calving seasons in a number of ways. First, their calving seasons are usually much shorter than our typical 42-day or 60-day calving season. They also tend to calve in the same areas each year, areas that are fairly open so they can spot predators and where the grass is very lush so the migration can slow and only small distances must be traveled each day for fresh grass. 
Most cows calve during the middle of the day while the herd grazes and ruminates. By the time the herd moves on the next day, the newborn calves have an, uh, had time to gain their strength and suckle and are strong enough to follow the herd. As soon as calving season is over, the migration rebounds to full speed and the herd leaves behind its calving grounds, manure piles, afterbirths, flies, predators, and the predator's victims. Shortening our domestic calving seasons to 42 days or shorter will help make this period more manageable. To strengthen the bond between cow and calf so the calf will be more likely to follow its mother during pasture moves, do not tag or process calves during the calving season. Also, rigorously cull cows with poor maternal instincts to improve the maternal instincts of your herd. The location you choose as your calving area is extremely important. Time your grazing rotation so cows will calve on the lushest open pastures on your farm. That way, cows, calves cannot hide in the brush and the herd requires less space to calve, which makes it easier to find calves that are left behind. A consistent, rigorous daily pasture rotation will help establish a routine that the cows can count on. Moves occur at the same time each day. Don't cheat and move cattle every other day. Invariably, when the herd is bunched tightly in a predictable daily pasture rotation, the majority of births occur after the daily pasture move, during grazing period, or the rumination, settle down period that follows grazing. In this way, the calves have almost a full day to bond with their mothers and gain their strength before they are disrupted and the excitement of a herd move tests their attachment. In a tightly bunched grazing scenario, the cattle to identify strongly with the herd for security and fresh grass keeps curious cows occupied so they don't steal calves, which cows approaching labor are prone to do if they do not have sufficient space and too much time on their hands. Common conditions in a conventional calving scenario. As a result, calving cows seek to calve in the middle of the herd for protection rather than at the herd's periphery. Calving at the herd's periphery is reserved for continuous grazing, winter calving, and unhealthy cows, predator decoys, that are pushed there by the other cows. In the wild, a calf born outside of the herd is gradually introduced to the herd by its mother at a later date when the calf has gained some strength. Neither the calf nor the herd identifies with one another until after the introduction. A calf born within the boundaries of the herd is automatically accepted by the herd and immediately identifies the herd as its security zone. When it feels threatened, such as during herd moves, it is more likely to follow the herd than hide. Three management options. We have three options for successfully managing our grazing rotation during the calving season. The least desirable option is to suspend the daily pasture rotation for the duration of the calving season by providing the herd with enough pasture to last the entire calving season. The second best option is to continue providing the herd with a fresh slice of pasture every day without moving the fence back so the pasture gets larger every day. The best option is to manage the cattle in such a way as to enable you to continue the daily pasture rotation with the back fence following behind exactly, exactly as during other times of the year. Suspend the daily pasture rotation. In the first and least desirable option, you designate a large calving area that contains enough grass to accommodate the herd's grazing needs for the duration of the calving season, eliminating the herd rotation for this period of time. By avoiding herd moves during calving, you avoid accidentally leaving calves behind and you prevent the pandemonium of cows losing their calves and the confusion of a complicated pasture move. To prevent unnecessary nutrient transfer, choose a site that is as flat as possible without trees or bushes or any other cover so that there are no shade magnets that will automatically attract cattle and accumulate manure. Prepare the site by calving by having it grazed briefly at the very beginning of the spring green up so it can provide a significant volume of forage prior to calving without becoming overly mature. Also having the grazing herd sweep across areas that will be excluded from calving grounds to try to prevent the grass in those areas from becoming overly mature by the time the grass rotation resumes. At the end of calving season, you have a big roundup and resume rotation. Despite the best plans and preparation, this option inevitably leads to a significant disruption in the effectiveness of your grazing management, causes significant nutrient transfer to favorite cattle hangouts, shade areas, and water sites, increases parasite pressure from flies hatching out of manure piles, and puts the calves at risk of disease from oral fecal contamination, particularly if a period of wet weather occurs while the grazing rotation is suspended. An outbreak of scours or cochidiosis on grass is almost always caused by oral fecal contamination due to a stalled grazing rotation, especially if there is wet weather to incubate the disease. So it just sounds like really you should be moving even during the calving season. So you got to get those calves with their moms.
Continue the daily pasture rotation, but do not move the back fence. The second best option for managing your calving season on grass is significantly better because the grass in your chosen calving area is rationed out daily, slice by slice. Although you give a fresh slice of grass to the cattle every day, however, the back fence is not moved so the cows have access to the entire previously grazed pasture in case they leave their calves behind. Flies hatching out of the newer piles act as a back fence and fresh grass is the motivator for cattle to remain with the herd. This sounds like it makes a lot of sense. Each new slice must be adjacent to the previous slice so a natural progression keeps the animals off the previously grazed manure laden areas and the cows can easily retrieve their calves. If the progression works so that the already grazed grass slices get further and farther away from each new day's grazing slice, it will become progressively more tedious for cattle to go back to the old slices through the hatching flies. Calves usually stop their hiding behavior within five days as they gain strength to follow their mother. So unless you see cows calve in previously grazed areas, you can move the back fence to follow the grazing rotation about a week behind the lead fence. Again, fresh food at the leading edge of the rotation motivates the herd to stay together, but only if the water access point moves along with the leading edge of fresh grass. Focus the cattle's water needs at the leading edge of the grazing rotation by using either a portable water trough placed inside each fresh daily slice of grass or an access point, gate or raised wire, opening into a water alley from the fresh grass slice. Water sites, mineral licks, shade, and anything else that draws cattle back into previously grazed areas will prevent you from closing the back fence behind the cattle because of the risk of cows depositing their calves in these areas. Slowing down the grazing rotation in an effort to create smaller pastures so abandoned calves can be spotted more easily creates an abundance of overly mature grass at the leading edge of the grazing rotation. The combination of overgrazed and undergrazed grasses limits the productivity of your grass and hurts your winter grazing reserve. Tall, seedy grass irritates cattle's eyes, creating an ideal environment for pink eye in the abundance of tall, mature, unpalatable grass clumps that young calves can hide in uh, makes the move makes moving the back fence that much more difficult. The grazing rotation during calving season must continue to be matched to the speed of grass regrowth just as during the rest of the year. And right here below we have this picture um, of a sort of grid layout. This optimal layout for calving on pasture enables daily pasture moves into immediately adjacent pasture slices and facilitates moving the back fence to accompany, accompany the cattle's daily pasture rotation. So we see the fence can be moved forward behind them. Continue the daily pasture rotation, including moving the back fence daily. In a third and best option for calving during the grazing rotation, the cattle are managed in such a way that the grass in the designated calving area can be rationed out daily in adjacent slices and access to water accompanies each day's fresh grass slice. The back fence is moved with the cattle uh, as it is during the normal grazing rotation for the rest of the year. The herd must be moved at the same time each day without fail to promote calving within the herd and to encourage uh, cows to calve after the daily pasture move because each new slice is adjacent to the previous day's slice just across a single 32 inch high portable wire the mothers are never separated from their calves by any great distance and calves can run underneath the wire to rejoin them and daily moves to adjacent paddocks, the trip is not difficult for the calves and the cows do not feel the panic of having to run to keep up with the herd. A cow knows the routine, so she knows the herd will not abandon her. This sense of security ensures that she either will wait for her calf or will return for it within the first few minutes after the pasture move. By contrast, longer pasture moves risk a cow's temporarily abandoning her calf to ensure her own place in the herd. If a cow starts bawling or pacing along the back fence line with a full udder, a few hours after the pasture move, you'll know that a calf has been left behind. Opening the gate is usually all that's needed for the cow to retrieve her calf and rejoin the herd. Implicit to the success of this approach, however, is that you observe your herd's behavior very carefully throughout the day so you will notice any behavioral cues that indicate that a calf has been left behind. You cannot simply move the herd and then walk away for the remainder of the day, as you would during the rest of the year's pasture moves. Any cow that does not have a calf at the end of the calving season should be cold. This method, therefore, is also a system of improving maternal instincts. The layout of the pasture divisions in the calving areas play a big role in the success or failure 
of an ongoing pasture rotation during calving with a moving back fence. If the terrain is flat and divided into narrow adjacent slices of fresh grass that run parallel to one another, see the illustration on page 84, the back page, the herd is never visually separated during a pasture move. But if the paddock layout creates a situation where the next slice is a long distance from the previous slice, or if the topography can hide a cow from the herd, she will choose the herd before the calf. In the wild, the calf that does not follow the herd jeopardizes its own survival as well as its mother's. If the cow is visually separated from the security of the herd, she is predisposed to abandon a calf that does not follow. This is also why it is extremely important to train the herd to move calmly at the sound of the come cow signal and maintains a sense of security in the herd. If the herd rushes headlong through the gate to reach fresh pasture, the excitement of the moment will panic a new mother into thinking she needs to hurry to follow the herd. If she panics, she is likely to abandon her calf, more likely to abandon her calf than coax it to follow a calm migration. End of chapter five. So we learned all about fencing and moving cows around. See you next time.